Okay, welcome everybody to this uh, mathematics seminar this morning. It's a pleasure for me to have to introduce Tony Carberry from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, it's his first visit to SCTP. Pleasure to have you here, Tony. You'll speak to us today about geometric and multilinear problems in analysis. Thank you, yours, Tony. Thank, thank you very much, Emmanuel. It's, um, I've, I've always wanted to come to the yes there. I've been sort of familiar with the, the notion of the city for a very long time and um it's the first time i've come and uh really loving it so far so so thank, thank you Emmanuel, for letting me be here and it's nice to meet all of you as well so okay so, so um i want to give a kind of quite a general kind of talk about multilinear techniques in analysis especially as they relate to geometric um problems but i mean there's not going to be any big theory on it now i really want to talk about some of the ideas and some of the connections that, that arise so so don't, don't look out for a big theorem because there there isn't one okay um this should maybe uh, why is this not moving the um, page uh you know how to make this uh, let's just get here let's try again try not Right, okay. All right. So um so I want to talk about some, as I said, some some problems which have a geometric flavor and have proved amenable to multilinear approaches. So my own interest in these problems arose quite specifically in harmonic analysis, the area that I work in. But one of the nice features of this is that understanding these problems to involve other areas of analysis, um, certain aspects of nonlinear analysis, certain aspects of functional analysis, both finite dimensional and infinite dimensional. And also discrete analysis. And of course, the, the influence of these techniques has been wider still in use geometric measure theory, number theory, etc. So the paradigm is that multilinear inequalities often underlie interesting geometrical phenomena. So we've got some geometrical phenomenon. We, we, we might not recognize that, it, that, that there's a there's a multilinear structure there or that multilinear techniques can be useful, but often they are. We're most we're more used to trying to deal with problems by using linear analysis, but sometimes multilinear analysis can, can, can bring new insights to, to what we're dealing with. <laughs> so let me just set out a few of these um, problems. So the first problem is the Kakea problem, which says that if you have a um, set in Euclidean space, which contains a unit line segment in every direction, must it have full dimension? And I don't really care whether we need Hausdorff or Minkowski or whatever dimension, any sensible version of dimension. Um, then there's the classical isoperimetric problem. You take a set E in Euclidean space with a given surface area, boundary of a given surface area. Um, what's the largest that its volume can be? And then third, perhaps, so the first two are probably more familiar to you. Certainly the second problem is very familiar to everyone. Um, the third one is probably a little less familiar um given a finite set of lines in rn so finite set of doubly infinite straight lines how big can this set of joints be and a, a joint for a family of lines is some point in euclidean space where n of these lines meet and these end lines the directions of these lines span the whole space okay, so so it's, it's a corner which lives, lives inside a plane um doesn't count but if something has in, in three dimensions if it has three vectors and they they, 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 they point to none in, in, in directions which are completely independent, then that's a joint. Then we'd like to know how many joints you can have given a finite set of lines. So these are the, the, the problems I want to focus on. So a particular, you know, a surprising insight, perhaps, that certainly was surprising for me, was that this last problem, this joint problem, is really intrinsically multilinear in, in nature. Um, it's certainly not apparent from the from the statement of the problem, but in fact, it really is a multilinear problem. There's, there's no avoiding it. Okay, so um, some of the techniques and ideas that we'll um, maybe meet on the way, um, things from nonlinear analysis, I mean, not the most sophisticated stuff that, <laughs> that, that we all should have learned to say as a graduate student, um, Brow Fitz Point Theorem, the Borsuk Ulam Theorem, um, variants of uh, Minimax theorems, um, the Keefan Minimax Theorem, for example. Uh, functional analysis, as I said, both infinite dimensional and finite dimensional, uh, and, and geometric analysis. So I, I don't want to go into any any detail here, but but the but the the the, the, the kind of the, the the one the example I have in mind in particular is that if you have a convex set in Euclidean space and it's and it's in some sort of standard position, let's say I don't want to be too precise about what that means. If some hypersurface bisects 
this convex set, so, so it's, it, 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 it bisects into two regions of equal volume, then the area in which it does so must be large. And of course, you can have a long sausage and chop it down the middle, and that's not true. So you have to put it into a standard position first. But once you put it in a standard position, then you can expect the bisecting the, um, so if it looks like a ball, you bisect with a, the hyperplane, and then obviously the, the intersection, the disc where it intersects has large area. So, so, so this type of idea. So in, in, you know, in, in more generality, these are things called cheaper cuts, which arise in respect to the theory of manifolds, but I don't really want to go into that. And also discrete analysis, discrete the connection to intercompetent geometry. There's this joints problem that I mentioned a minute ago. Um, you, you can see that it's somehow connected with intercompetent geometry. Okay, so let's talk about a few of these problems. Um, the Kakea problem, as, a, as we said, a Kakea set is a set which contains some of the line segments in all possible directions. So a Kakea set is necessarily big, and the question is how big must it be? Must it have full dimension n? So this is known to be true in two dimensions by work of Roy Davies and also uh, almost at the same time, uh, Charlie Peckman and Antonio Bordova. Um, but as soon as the dimension is bigger than two, nobody knows it's wide, wide open, this problem. So um, Kakea sets uh, to fill out um, a whole n-dimensional subset of Rn, then it, it must mean that the way that the, the, the lines um, overlap um, but they, they can't, they, you can't have all these lines piled up on top of each other because then they wouldn't fill out a space, a whole you know, ball or, 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 or a, um, you would have a line segment in every direction. So, um, so the overlap of these lines must be severely controlled if this is going to happen. And so we want to quantify this in a, in a discrete and finitistic way. So, 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 we, so we can do the analysis more, more, more sensibly. So we fix a small parameter delta and we replace unit line segments by, um, by, a finite family of, of tubes of cross-sectional area delta. So they're just slight fattenings of a, of a line segment. And um, we try to understand this overlap function. So th this is the, um, the thing which, yeah, we just bridge point x, we count how many, how many of these tubes it's in. And the, the, the intuition is that in order for a um, pair set to have large, um, you know, to fill out a whole n-dimensional subset, then, then this must be under some size control, otherwise we haven't got a home. Okay, so we assume that the, the, the tubes, so they have little cross-sectional area, uh, cross-sectional width delta. So, so basically you can, you can assume that the tubes have delta, delta separated directions because any two tubes which are within um, delta units of each other angle-wise, then, the, then one is contained in the double of the other. So there's not, nothing really going on there. So we can assume that the tubes have delta separated directions. And, and as I said, it's quantity of upper bound on this function, signal control over the overlap. So um, the, the way we will, as because we're analysts, we want to bound this thing in an LP space. So the first thing to think about, well, we'll keep with one, there's no useful information here because you just have with the, 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 you just have this bound, which is useless, doesn't tell you anything at all. And when P is infinity, um, this measures maximal overlap, the, 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 the maximum number of points that are that you <laughs> have to be in. And again, that doesn't really tell you enough. So you've got to choose a P which is in between one and infinity to get some valuable information. Okay, so we'll just change notation and scale everything up um, and work now with tubes of length R, length N rather, um, and uh, unit cross section, and uh, one of the, the directions are separated by one over N. So I've just scaled things up because I prefer to work on big scales rather than small scales. Okay, so the correct exponent, it turns out, to, to, to help with this problem is not one or infinity, but the number n over n minus one in between. And um, so here we have a, uh, a modified version of the overlap function. I've now called my tubes R. Um, and so I've got some coefficients AR before I just had all the ARs were one, but I have some coefficients. I put this, this modified overlap function in L n over n minus one, and I need to get control of that by the little l n over n minus one norm of these coefficients. So if all of them are one and zero, this is just a you know, sort of number. And the correct control to get is um, n log n. So I don't, I don't want to go into why simple examples generate this as a, as a, as a natural, um, as natural numbers here. And, and again, if you could prove this was true, anything else that you could say of interest on the scale of exponents here with other, other exponents here would follow trivially from interpolation by the two other things I just mentioned. Okay, so this, this is the thing that, that one would like to understand. And um, 
solving this is this is called the the compare problem. This is the yeah. So, so if this trying to prove inequality one is is what's now called the the Kakea maximal problem. It's called the Kakea maximal problem because it's the linear dual of a problem about a maximal function and the maximal <laughs> function. And we're not, I'm not going to go back into this um, maximal function formulation at all, but for those of you who are familiar with the hard little maximal function and the strong maximal function and so on, just to make points of contact with that. So instead of taking maximal averages over balls of, um, of various radii containing a point or, or, or rectangles, um, which are axis parallel, we, we, we take the maximal average um, at, at, at when, when the variant this time is we look at um, directions on the on the sphere rather than points. So for a direction only got on the unit sphere, and if um, f is a function defined on Rn, then we take the, the maximal average over um, uh, rectangles of side cross sectional area one and length um, n uh, over all uh, such rectangles which are parallel to that direction. So it has a it has a spirit similar to the hard little maximum function, the strong maximal function, there's a little difference. And the conjecture, which is dual to one, is that this maximal function is bounded on Ln with some sort of logarithmic um, grow up in the in the index large n, something like that. So this is why this is called a Kakea maximal conjecture, because it's the dual of a um, of, 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 of a classical maximal statement. Okay, so um let's now go to the um isoparametric problem. So of course it is crude to form the isoparametric problem asks us to show that we can control the volume of a set by the appropriate power of its um, surface area of its boundary. And of course, we like to identify the best constant and its extremizers, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, this is um, a, a millennia old problem. It goes back to the, the ancient Greeks, of course, the satisfactory solutions with any number of degrees of rigor and generality, especially here in Italy, are uh, been known for, um, for, for hundreds of years. Um, and there are, um, of course, untold variants of this problem. It's just the, the most emblematic, simple problem, the one I mentioned there. Uh, okay, there's a very satisfactory solution of this problem by the linear Sobolev inequality, which takes a function, a CFT function, compact support, and uh, bounds its L n over n minus one norm by the L1 norm of its gradients with a sharp constant. But I, but I don't want to take this point of view today. First of all, it's linear, but, but, but more, um, yeah. I, uh, secondly, it's also non positive. I mean, there's a cancellation involved, there's a gradient, so you're integrating something. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so, so um, I, I want to, I, I don't want to take that point of view today. I want to regard that as a little too, too subtle. I want to stay crude. So what about a multilinear um, uh, approach to isoparametric problems? Well, there's a there's a, there's a, a very well known um, uh, approach uh, closely related to Gagliardo Nuremberg form of the Sobolev inequality, but which is intrinsically multilinear. So um, just go through this slowly. I mean, it begins with a tautolo tautological observation. If you take a set E, then um, it's contained in um, the Cartesian product of its projection on a hyperplane. With the direction perpendicular to that microplane. Okay. So if you want to write that in mathematical formulae, so the characteristic function of a set is uh, uh, at the point x is dominated by the characteristic function of the projection of the set, um, where you drop out the variable which is perpendicular to the to where you're doing the, the projection. Okay, so that being true, it also holds for the permutations of it. We think about projecting on a particular coordinate hyperplane, we could do it for any coordinate hyperplane. So we take that inequality and we do it for all um, possible coordinate hyperplanes, and um, we get uh, that. And then we take the, um, the, 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 the geometric mean of these. That's not a geometric mean, but, but, but an appropriate power of these. Just take, take a, you know, multiply these together and then take a power. But all the numbers are like zero or one, so it doesn't matter what power you take. Okay, so that's a simple um, geometric observation that we have this <coughs> inequality here. And that's just repeating what I said on the previous slide. I'm going to call um, fj the characteristic function of the projection um, of. Uh, of, of yeah, it's the character. Well, it's the characteristic function of the projection of E on the J coordinate axis, and we have to think of the Lucas Whitney inequality. The Lucas Whitney inequality, the general inequality, multilinear inequality, tells us no matter what 
uh, L1 functions we have on Rn minus one, if we evaluate um, these things uh, on projections of the core of the hyperplanes, take this same power that I've been advertising here and integrate it on Rn, then we have this um, the, the control of this quantity here by the, the appropriate um, mean of the, uh, the L1 more cyclical functions. And so this is the Loomis Whitney inequality. <coughs> And um, there's an immediate consequence of that, uh, applying it in, in this setting. Here we have the volume of E is, of course, um, uh, uh, less than or equal to the, um, the, the, the FJ to the characteristic bundle of the pi JEs. So that's, the, um, that, that's the, the, the geometric observation that we had here. And if we work out the, uh, the, the, the uh, L1 norm of the characteristic function of the projection, of E on, on the J coordinate axis is certainly no worse than the um the surface area of the um of, of, of the um of the boundary um uh, that part of the boundary which is perpendicular and then it, it, we can get a we get we get the a, a version of the um isoparametric inequality um, out of this all being the wrong constant so I, I'm not I'm not really accepting that constant today I'm I'm more wanting to think about the the methods and the techniques. Okay, so, so that's a um, little bit about the isoparametric uh, inequality. So the point is that the, the multilinear Loomis Whitney inequality helps us qualitatively under explain the isoparametric inequality, even if it doesn't give us the sharp constants. So that's the, the moral of this. Okay, so um, let's unpack the Loomis Whitney inequality. Um, there it is again. Let's take FJ. So these, this applies to all L1 functions living on Rn minus one. I'm going to let Fj be a step function, which is a, the sum of characteristic. It, it's a it's characteristic. It's a sum of weight, it's a weighted sum of characteristic functions of balls. So the balls be a unit balls in Rn minus one. On each unit ball, we put some weight Hjv. Certainly an L1 function, and we can um, work out what the inequality says. Right? Well, it's easy to work out the L1 norm of Fj. And what is fj of pi jx? That's simply the same weighted sum, but now of the characteristic function of the tube, um, which lives above the ball B. So the, the, the tube in, in Rn, whose projection on the, um, on the Rn minus one, on Rn minus one is that ball. So uh, what do we get? We just rewrite the Lewis Whitney inequality in this case. What is it? It's the integral of a product of this weighted sum of characteristic functions of tubes, and the, the tubes T in this, this J component of the product here uh, all, are all tubes which are exactly parallel to the J coordinate axis. Okay. And, uh, and, and, and this is just what how the L1 norms come out. So, so this is a um, this is a, a particular case of the Loomis Whitney inequality, and it has a sort of more more geometric flavor because it's talking about um, geometric objects, tubes, um, these tubes which are have, have units uh, cross section because these balls are unit balls. And um, it's sort of talking about how, how the overlaps of these things, are, you know, the, the, of these different families of tubes when you multiply these quantities together um, on the control. Okay, so, so, so this is a special case of the Loomis Whitney inequality. And in fact, it's an equivalent form. Of the Loomis Whitney inequality, but by basically just by, by, by dilation invariance. So if you want to prove the Loomis Whitney inequality of general Fs, you can assume that the Fs are um, have compact support, um, and you can you, know, you can assume that the Fs are step functions of uh, we're, 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 step functions of density L1, and then you can say, well, for a step function, there's going to be a smaller size of step function. Then I just work with that smaller size and I, and I scale everything up the inequality scale invariant so I can assume the size is one. So they're actually equivalent um, statements. And this, this is the formulation I want to focus on because it's similar in spirit to the formulation of the Kikea problem. So Kikea meeting isometry, so it's Kikea meeting Loomis Whitney rather. Um, so the Loomis Whitney inequality, just to remind you, is um, this inequality here where we take curly TJ to the family of all. One tubes which are parallel to EJ, we take this product, these families raised into the power one over A minus one, we dominate by the product of these L1 norms, the, the, the little L1 norms, the coefficients. And the Kikea problem, the Kikea maximal problem, it has tubes of a fit of a length R, 
So if in the Lucas Whitney case, my tubes are infinitely long in both directions. In the Kakea case, they have length r, sorry, length n, and they have a, a, a condition on the directions, they must be n minus one set n to the minus one separated. But similar, but like, it's a similar sort of thing. We're looking at a weighted sum of characteristic functions of these things raised to a power, and we're trying to control that by an appropriate norm <laughs> of these coefficients here. So I want to sort of draw out the parallel between these two formulations. That's more what I want to do than anything else. And what we will do is make a common approach to these problems, and we'll, we'll, we'll retain the, the common form of the left-hand side of these two inequalities, or at least the spirit of the common form of these um, inequalities, the, of these formulations, these quantities, but we'll relax the conditions. So in, in this case, we have exact, we have tubes exactly parallel to EJ, and in this case, we have tubes um, which with some condition on the directions, but we'll kind of do a hybrid where we, we we consider tubes which are roughly parallel to EJ, um, but not necessarily exactly parallel. So we'll have some of the flavors of both of these. Okay, so, so um, we begin, um, we, we write down the same thing as the Lewis Whitney inequality. This is what the Lewis Whitney inequality was. If the TJ, if the tubes TJ and the J family are exactly parallel to the J family basis vector, this is the Lewis Whitney inequality. But we're going to relax that and we're going to ask whether this might be true. If the directions of the tubes in the J family are allowed to be within, say, 10 degrees, some small amount of the, um, of the J standard basis vector. Okay, so that might seem a fairly um, mild um, relaxation, and you might think, well, this is going to be the proof is going to be similar to the proof of the Lewis Whitney inequality, it's going to be easy. But in fact, it's really, um, it's actually quite a lot harder. I mean, it would be more than enough, for example, to handle a substantial portion. Of, of the multilinear of, of the, the Kakea problem. It wouldn't solve the Kakea problem, but if you think about it a little bit, um, it would solve a substantial portion of the Kakea problem. Because if we think about um in the Kakea problem, we have uh, a, a bunch of um uh tubes in different directions. If we let TJ be the tubes from the Kakea problem with directions close to EJ, then the contribution from 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 from, from these uh Families of tubes is under control because the transversal contribution to, to, to the left hand side um, in Kakea is, is essentially the left hand is essentially this because if we take the um you know we have an uh, we have a something like this raised to the power n over n minus one we write each of those factors the, 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 the end that we're raising it to we write out um n times so we have n lots of things to the power one over n minus one and then in each of those uh, multiple cans, we consider only the um, the tubes coming from the J direction. So we get um, something exactly like this. And so if we have something like two um, by help, we will have um, we will have something like this. And uh, using Helder's inequality on this, we we get something which is actually much better than what we um well it's at least a, a quite a bit better than what we need for the for the linear compare problem. So on the one hand, we have a little L one bound here. And um, we, there's not even a logarithmic term, so so it's not it's not just which it's not just the kind of an intellectual exercise to consider things like this. It would actually make a, a, a substantial contribution to the Kakea um, problem uh, if we understood this. And it's not as obvious as it, as it might seem. Okay. So um, many other possibilities come to mind. Um, I don't think I want to um, uh, go into that very much. One, one thing I just do want to. Um, say is that, that there's nothing particularly special about the standard orthonormal, you know, the, the, the standard orthonormal basis. We can take any um, linearly independent set of unit vectors, and something similar um, will be true for the Lewis Whitney inequality. So the Lewis Whitney inequality um, becomes this you, you, if you project onto the um, hyperplane perpendicular to a unit vector omega j rather than the unit vector per, perpendicular to the j standard basis vector, you have to pay with some. Uh, Determinant factor. So omega one wedge 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 omega n is just the, the volume of the parallelopiped whose sides are omega one, omega two, omega three, and so on. So when it's when it's a standard basis, then that number is just one. And when it's not, it's smaller than one. Okay, so, so that's the uh version of the Lewis with the inequality. And there's a corresponding version of the KA inequality, the multi-linear K inequality. So we have to um yeah. If we're going to consider a more precise version of the multilinear Kakea problem, we will have to take account of this. You can't avoid thinking about this to some extent. But this is this is just simple affine invariance considerations. Okay. What about multilinear Kakea then? 
So yeah, the first, this is um, a result which um, we proved with um, John Bennett and Terry Tao um, quite a long time ago now, <laughs> um, which uh, applied to the situation where the, our tubes are within 10 degrees of the, the standard basis um, vector tubes. And we proved what we want to prove, except that um, what we really want here is we want that power Q to be one over n minus one. And we weren't able to prove that. We were able to prove it only with Q bigger than one over n minus one. You might say, well, that breaks the um oh, that breaks the scale invariant of the problem. And of course it does. In fact, that's why that's why we didn't choose because we, we couldn't prove the scale invariant inequality, endpoint inequality. So we had to break the scale invariant and write down something which we could do, and that that's what we could do. So um so okay, that's all well and good. Um so the more precise version, which was um, proved a few years later by um, Larry Guth, and then a the more sophisticated form by Paul Gannon Guth, and then a little while after that, Stefan Valdimarco and I gave um, an explanation of it, which I think was slightly more, um, so we'll have to be careful and remember the thing that's being recorded, which is more um, comprehensible to, um, to, to normal people than um, perhaps the, the proof of um, Guth, Larry Guth was, um, or at least to analysts, let's say. Um, so, uh, Anyway, so, so, so that, that's that, that's a more precise version, and, and now, notice now that we do have the um the correct exponent. Okay, so this is the the correct exponent, and it's also got the correct um determinant wedge product factor. Because remember on the previous slide, um we had this whoops, we had this um uh, factor here. So I put that onto the other side of the inequality, and there indeed it is on the other side of the inequality. So E of T is the is the unit vector in the direction of the vector of the T. Okay. So a few words about the proofs. Um, the proof of the the, the plain vanilla theorem with Bennett and, and Tau, we did it by a heat flow technique. And the the, the, the idea was that um, somehow we, we take the positions of the tubes, which are somewhat arbitrary. And we, 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 we flow them, we flow their positions so that each tube starting off, so we start off at time zero, by the time we've got to time one, the tubes have moved parallel to where they were, but they now all, at time one, they all pass through the origin. And um, the virtue of this is that, and this is where the hard work was, that if you look at the left-hand side of the multilinear inequality we were trying to prove, and of course, there'll now be a time parameter in it, but that left hand side is basically increasing, not exactly increasing, but it's quasi quasi monotone increasing under this flow. So if you can control matters when t is one, then you can control matters when t is zero. And controlling matters when t is one is, is trivial because if all the tubes pass through one point, then this a very simple calculation reveals that it's true. So that the, the depth will be the, the monotonicity under this on this heat flow. Okay. Um the full theorem it was given by entirely different methods. This is Guth's argument involving duality, convex geometry, algebraic topology, isoparametric considerations, algebraic geometry, polynomial method, the Zeus theorem. So the, 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 the later proof that I think was Stefan Waldemarsson somehow streamlined, it, it took the algebraic topology, which was to do cohomology classes and products and the Lushtenitz, Schneid, Schneidman, Vanish and Lemmer, none of which I could understand. It took those things out of the proof <laughs> and it replaced it by a simple off-the-shelf off the application of the borsuk ulam theorem, which is something that you know, at least an analyst can kind of get their head around readily. So, um, <clears throat> okay, that's just a couple of remarks. So, so let's look at some aspects of the latter approach. Um, the, the, the the approach to the Guth's argument, but using perhaps some of our simplified techniques. So that's the um, multilinear Kakea theorem. That we're trying to prove. Um, and, and here we just we take one step up into abstraction just because it's going to be helpful to us. So we observe that this inequality we're trying to prove, which looks quite complicated, is really, I mean, it's a special case of um, a, a more general um, setting where we have um, a, 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 positive, a positive multilinear operator. So in this case, I've got a positive multilinear operator given by. Um, uh, it's acting on some coefficients a1 up to an. It's acting on it in, in this way, and it's, it's giving me a function on on, on Rn. Um, that is the way. Well, the, the, by the way it's written down, yeah, it's a positive multilinear operator, and um, the, the integral kernel of this multilinear operator is precisely um, 
uh, chi t1 of x up to chi t, chi t n of x. Um, and then I'm not sure you've got all those subscripts there. Um, e of t1, where to return to e of tn. So, so it's just a way of thinking about it. This inequality, I mean, it, it's just a bit of thinking about it functional analytically is helpful. So it's an inequality for a um, for positive multilinear operator and it has this form. Okay, so um, so th just earlier this year, um, I proved with my um, former student Michael Tang that um, there's a very nice duality theorem for, for, for multilinear operators of this sort. So now we're doing a bit of functional analysis for a little while. So um, suppose we have um, suppose we have a bound of this sort. We have some q bigger than or equal to one. We have a, a multilinear bound on, on, on a positive multilinear operator with curl on that of this sort. So, so this is the same. This is what we've been um, talking about with, um, I guess, uh, yeah. It, it, this is of the form we have multilinear decay. Then the, the statements of the duality theorem, or the hard part of the duality theorem, is that if this holds, then for every g in the dual space of LQ, you, there exist functions g1 of x, y1, and so on, up to gd of x, y, d. This is d-linear now. So at the moment, there's no, no relation between the degree of linearity and the dimension of this, of this space. This space now x is just an abstract measure space, nothing, nothing more. So, um, uh, yes, so we can we can somehow if we take g of x to the power of d and multiply it by the kernel of the multilinear operator, then that can be pointwise dominated by a, a product of these functions g of x y one g d of x y d, and such that so so getting that by itself is easy. You just let, let little g j gjs be very big. Um, so we have these some upper bound control on the gjs. Well, this is the upper bound control. The GJs, if you integrate them with respect to um, on, the, on the space X, you, and then uniformly in Y, they are controlled by the LQ prime norm of, of G. Okay. So um, that is um, a kind of a nice theorem. Um, the, 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 the converse um, theorem that if, if you have this control here, um, and you have this inequality here, then you have this inequality. That, 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 that's an easy application of Helms inequality. So that, that's the easy half of what, what I'm saying now. The hard half is if you have this, then you get that. Okay, but the, the eagle eyed amongst you will notice that um, this doesn't actually quite make sense, at least at the moment, because I've got what is what is B, but I didn't tell you what B was. Um, so provided we have an auxiliary condition, and this is where this B comes in. <clears throat> And yeah, I don't. I don't want to go on about this auxiliary condition because basically, because I don't really understand it. I mean, I, don't, yeah, I, I it works, and 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 there's a there's a load of special cases in which it's true. Um, you can apply it, but I don't really understand it, and I, I, I'd quite like to get to the bottom of it anyway. So, in the in the auxiliary condition is that um, the kernel can be dominated pointwise by some other functions, and if you well, then there's and there's this multilinear. Inequality between these, um, between these. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't want to obsess about it because I, I don't understand it. But, but, but in some cases, it, it's extremely trivial to check. So, for example, if, we, if we're in the case of the plain vanilla multilinear Kakea theorem, where we're only looking at, at tubes whose directions are within EJ, with, within ten degrees of the J standard basis vector, then it's completely trivial to check this auxiliary condition with B equals one, but B equals constant. <laughs> So it, it, it shouldn't put you off, although, as I say, I don't, I don't claim I fully understand this, this problem. And then there's certainly no hint that this is a necessary condition, but, but without it, the convert, without this, this, this condition here, um, you know, the, 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 what I was kind of pretending to prove before definitely isn't true. You do need some extra condition, but exactly what the correct condition is, it's not quite clear. Anyway, so this, this is the, um, the easy half, which I mentioned already. Um, the, the, the auxiliary structural condition, you know, we, we can't get away without it, but if we have it, then the two statements are equivalent. And we call it a duality theorem because um, when the degree of multilinearity is D, it just reduces to a kind of something which we, we learn in first year of graduate school or as an undergraduate, that if you have a, a linear map T going from L1 to LQ, then um, that's equivalent with the bounded linear map with, with the actual one going from T going from LQ prime to L infinity, it just reduces to that. So, that, so it, it's an instance of a duality theorem in a multilinear setting. Okay. 
right. So um, what's the main step in the duality theorem? The main step is to um, use some version of the key fan minimax principle. So the mini minimax principles tell you, well, you if you have some function of two variables, the soup of the int is always less than or equal to the infant soup. That's always a good exercise for first year undergraduate um, students. Um, but, but you can reverse the order under certain conditions. So under certain continuity, convexity, and compactness assumptions on A and B and phi, you can reverse the inequality. And, you know, and there's kind of, well, again, there's a whole industry of, um, of uh, study of, of, of minimax um, theorems. And again, it's very strong here in Italy. Um, the, the point I want to make is that somehow it's the existence, of, it's the fact that it's, this is not just an if, it's a minimum. It's the existence of this minimum, which at the end of the day furnishes the, 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 the detruple in our, in our theorem. So it's really kind of important that this min is a min and not an inf. But, but again, that's a feature of when you've got compactness, you expect an inf to be a min anyway. So, okay, so the proof of this minimax theorem is non constructive. It's kind of morally the same ballpark as the Brown fixed point theorem and the harm balance theorem. So, you know, you don't know how to do this constructively. And at the end, I've got a, I've got a question which um, relates to a very specific case of the application of this duality theorem, and um, yeah, which I hope you know, one or more of you might be interested in, in looking at. Okay, tantalizing open form at the end. Okay, so back to multilinear Kikea. So, um, it, it, so, so, so Goop's argument for multilinear Kikea basically involved constructing this sort of factorization I told you about. Now, the, the abstract theorem doesn't tell you how to construct a factorization, but Goop managed to do it by bare hands. You know, of course, he doesn't get sharp constants and things, but, but, but still he managed to do so. So it relies very much on topological and convex properties <laughs> in the Euclidean space, and it's not really clear how you proceed in other contexts. Um, so what we have to do is um, show that for every, so just, just unpacking the abstract duality theorem in our context, for every G in Ln of Rn, and it, it, it's kind of important that, that the dimension, the Ln space, the N there is the same as the N there. Um, it's somehow a reflection of the dimensionality of Rn. So for every G which is constant on, on the lattice of unit cubes, you've got to find functions um, G of Q and T, um, such that if you take G of, capital G of Q raised to the power N and you take this weight product of tubes T1 up to Tn, then this is this is dominated, this is dominated by the product of these functions gj, and such that if you soup, um, you take any tube at all, and you um, look at the, um, the if you sum the quantities gj of q and t over all cubes which live in which live inside particular tube t, then that's dominated by the ln norm of, um, of the function you start with. So um I mean, the reason we proved the duality theorem was really because we didn't understand why Good's argument worked. We, we, I mean, to me, it just seemed mad that you could you could even think about doing this. And um, okay, but with the benefit of hindsight with the duality theorem, you can see that it, it kind of had to work. Um, so it wasn't wasn't so mad, but, um, but it still doesn't tell you how to do it. Okay, <laughs> so what's the heart of Good's construction? Um, he, he 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 builds these functions g by first thinking about. Um, the quantity which he called directional volume, I prefer to call directional surface area. You take a hypersurface Z, a reasonable hypersurface in Rn, and a unit vector E, then let's look at the, um, the, the, the amount of the surface area of the hypersurface Z, which is due to being in direction E. So this is, if you like, it's the component of the surface area in direction E, something like that. And so Goots, the main, the main thing, in the, the main step in Goots argument was um, if you fix a, a, a function, capital G, then there's a polynomial hypersurface of controlled degree, degree controlled by the LN norm of, of G, such that for every Q, Q, every unit Q, Q, and each entry full of tubes meeting Q, we have this um, inequality here, the G of Q to the N is less than or equal to, um, sorry, times this wedge product, is less than these products, the products of these surface areas. So this is exactly the sort of thing we're looking for. These are the now these are the candidates for the, for the little GJ of Q and T's that I was talking about before. So th this is um this is the main step. And indeed, um, if we can do this, if we take um the, the, the functions little g simply to be the surface area, directional surface area 
um, uh, the, the functions, then um, this is the first bit of quality we want. The second bit of quality we want, which is this supremum of the sum of the Q, B, T, T to the G, J, and Q, T's, this comes followed then from the Zeus theorem, because if you think about um, summing up over all cubes beating a tube, and we're looking at these surface area quantities of Z intersect Q, but if we sum them up, this is looking at the surface area of Z intersect T. So you've got a tube T, you've got some sort of hypersurface passing through it any, any number of times. And if you, if, instead of looking at, so just take what one, one of the axes or, or one of the lines parallel to the tube, as you go through that line, you'll pass through the hypersurface a certain number of times, that number of times is controlled by the degree of the hypersurface. So the Zeus theorem gives you um, the rest of the other, uh, gives you what you need. So, um, so, so, so how, how does one prove the, the visibility theorem of you? Well, um, that, that, that's hard, as I said, but let, let's just have a taste of, um, of uh, how it goes. Um, that's what we'd like to do. Um, but let, let's move to a much easier task. Um, just to illustrate the idea, the easier task is to find a polynomial hypersurface of degree at most the same thing, such that for every cube, each ancient core of tubes transversally, meeting Q transversely, we have this. <coughs> so so um, why is this um, easier? Well, because um, if we take the, um, so if we're considering only tube, ancient cores of tubes meeting Q transversely, that means that these quantities these wedge product quantities are all one. And if we then take, so they're all one, we then take the nth roots of both sides of this. This says that g of q is less than or equal to the geometric mean of these surface areas. So what we're going to prove instead is the easier thing is that g of q is less than the arithmetic mean of these surface areas. Well, geometric mean is always less than the arithmetic mean. So we're, we're, we're making much, much, life much easier for ourselves if we only go for the arithmetic mean. And that's nice because the arithmetic mean of these surface areas um, is just the uh, is basically just the, um, the, the the standard surface area for Z set Q. So, so this is a much less technical um, thing to prove, and um, but it still will give the, the main idea. So um, so given a, 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 a function capital G on L n of R n, let's assume it's finitely supported and, and constantly on even cubes, and we break up each cube and its support into G to the n congruent subcubes, little q, so that the total number of cubes that I've got all together is capital G of q to the n for each one, so I have to sum on that, that's the number of um, cubes I have all together. And let's identify the space of polynomials PD with R capital D, where R capital, where capital D is um, uh, n plus B choose D, um, which is um, about uh, um, D to the n, okay, where some constant thing, I don't care at all about constant depending upon the dimension here. So the, the polynomials um, of degree and most D, the, the, the how many coefficients do you need to specify a polynomial of degree and most capital D? You need basically n plus D choose D simple elementary combinatorics. Okay, so we now consider this map phi, um, which takes the unit sphere um, in this space of polynomials to uh, a very large Euclidean space of dimension, um, the number of little cubes we've got, and what it does is for each polynomial P in the unit sphere of this, um, of this class of polynomials, it takes it to the, um, the integral of, uh, it, you look at the, the, the amount of, the amount of space in Q, which is taken up where P is positive and you subtract off the amount of space in Q taken up where P is negative. And then you do this for every Q, little, little Q, Q, little Q and out family, and you have a bunch of numbers there. And you notice that this function phi of capital P is equal to phi minus phi of little p. Yeah, if you replace P by minus P, you simply swap around, that becomes P negative, P less than zero, that becomes P bigger than zero, and you switch the sign. Okay. Um, it's also a continuous um, function. That's a little bit of work, but it's continuous. But the, this is where the Bohr Sagulam theorem from elementary nonlinear analysis or topology, if you like, comes in. Um, if we have a continuous map from uh, a sphere into a, a, a Euclidean space, which is um, which is odd or antipodal or um, whatever the right word is, equivariant, the way the, uh, then it, it will um, there must be it must take the value zero somewhere, provided the, the dimension of the sphere space here is at least as big as the dimension of the target space here. 
that the faucet wouldn't do and so on. Like so that means that um, provided the, the dimension, uh, the, the, the um, parameter little d is at least as big as the um, little ln norm of the g's, then there's a polynomial of degree d whose zero set z bisects each q. So, because phi of something being zero means that the amount of mass on the two halves is equal. And then, because these cubes are nice cubes, um, by Chiga cuts, we have that the, the surface area of the place where the cut takes place is, um, it is large. And, and if by scaling the, the correct power, the correct largeness is the, the n minus one power, the diameter of the cube. And um, that's the same as g of q to the minus n minus one, because that's how many. You put that many cubes um, in, 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 you pack that many g of, g of q to the n small cubes inside the unit cube. So now we just um, sum over the different small cubes and we get that the surface area of z intercept q is um, bigger than or equal to, to, to capital g of q. So that's a, a, a kind of um, you know, a, a potty version of a, 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 a of the easier result, but which, which captures the spirit of the good arguments. Okay, so the final 10 minutes or so, am I supposed to stop at, um, at any particular time? Or? Oh, yeah, so um, final 10 minutes, so let, let's um, go to the, the discrete setting and talk about the joints problem. Okay, so, so much of what we've talked about makes <laughs> at least makes sense in principle in more general settings. And um, you know, I think it's quite a challenge to understand um, what's, um, you know, what it might mean in some particular uh, you know, settings um, more general than the Euclidean space. So, so let's, for now, focus on a discrete setting where the role of Euclidean space is replaced by that of a vector space Fn over an arbitrary field. But, so some things change, some things, that, but, well, some things change in an obvious way. The vague measure becomes counting measure. Tubes become lines, so we somehow tend to be going back to K again. We're going back to lines, so we don't have any um, we don't have any um, sort of scales. So because um, we're not assuming the field is the reals, there's no Euclidean structure, and there's no um, there are no angles. So two lines either meet at a point or they don't. You know, we, we don't care about whether they they're nearly parallel or not. They either meet at a point or they don't. And the determinant factor. Which we had the um, E of L1 wedge 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 E of Ln, because we have, it's discrete, if either 0 or 1, it's 1 of the directions span and it's 0 otherwise. So in some sense, a lot of things begin to simplify. What um, things that, that are not so good are we don't have top of topology like the Borsa Coulomb theorem to help us. So the, the previous argument very much named the Borsa Coulomb theorem. We just don't have that in, in, in finite fields. Okay, so how much of what we've done can we recover and with what level of understanding? So that's somehow what I'll do for, for the rest of the, the talk. Um, so the Kikaya set and maximal problems, <coughs> they have satisfactory resolutions using the polynomial method um, from De Villa and for Ellenberg, Oberlin and Tau, um, respectively. So I, I, I don't want to um, focus on those. I want to think more about um, analog of, analog of multilinear Kikaya and so the analog of multilinear care in this setting is um, set in joints and multi joints. So, um, as I said at the very beginning, you've got a, a set of lines in Fn. Um, the joint is a point where any of these lines meet and where the directions of the tubes, the directions of the lines are linearly independent. And um, a multi joint is a similar thing, but this time we now have um, n families of lines L1 up to Ln. A multi joint is a, a joint. So it's, it's a point again where you, where n of these lines meet, but the, each, but, but there has to be exactly one line from each of the families. Okay? And the directions are linearly independent. <coughs> so the crude versions of the joints and multi joints problems consist in asking to bound the number of joints or the number of multi joints um, just by the sizes of the set L or, or in the multi joint setting. The, the families um, the of, 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 of the sets, but, but as, as we've seen, um, you know, it, it's been it's been beneficial to think about the overlap function in more in more general um, settings, and I'll come to that in a minute. But um, the, the joints um, theorem in its crude form 
the salt by um uh, by Larry Goof and Nets Cax, and then at least in three in three dimensions, didn't you? Billion space kilogram in the same week, Kaplan, Shearer, and Houston um, proved it in the n-dimensional case in the setting of Rn, and then several other people figured out um, that it was basically you can adapt the proof to, to general arbitrary fields. So that's the, the multilinear, so that, that, that's the, the, the vanilla, if you like, um, joints theorem without any multiplicities. And the underlying this was polynomial numbers. Um, it, this didn't resolve the more subtle problem where we expect to count without the number of multi-joints by this um, uh, product of the numbers of the members of families for one over n minus one, or the variance where we look at multiplicities. And that, as we've said, as I've said, has been proved to be um, proved to be very, um, very beneficial. So um, we want to. So looking at multiplicities, we want to to take the the base of the overlap function. This is the analog of the overlap function that we had before. In the linear case, and this is the analog of the overlap function that we had in the um, in the uh, in the multilinear case, and um, it was eventually proved um, by Rishang Zhang that for the joints problem, we can indeed count the um, the multiplicities of the joints and get the answer you expect. So, in the, the plain, you know, in, in the earlier theorem by Katz and Tao and so on, we were just we were just estimating these. Um, we had the same thing, but we said that we had n of x is one. So this is a sharper result having I mean, something much bigger in there. And then the multi joints problem um you have a similar thing. And um the, the interesting thing at least it's very interesting to me was that these problems these are actually equivalent <laughs> to each other. So um this one is it, it, this one is sort of explicitly multilinear. Um this one you can't see any obvious multilinear structure there but, but it is there because they're equivalent problems. Okay um the multi-joint problem is indeed the discrete analog. It's the correct discrete analog of multi-linear decay. So, so this has been um, solved. But something that are unsatisfactory is that somehow Zhang's argument and another one by Tidor, Yu, and Zhao, that they both establish these results directly. Um, so if we go back to what I said earlier about equivalence between the care maximal function and this LP bounds, this overlap function, basically the arguments of Zhang and Tidor, Yu, and Zhao they work on the side of the maximal function. They don't. They don't work on the side of the dual side that I've been working with throughout today. So it became an interesting question um, whether uh, whether we could do a, a proof on the dual side, and um, and indeed we proved. Well, Michael Tang proved in a in a in one way, and Michael and I proved entirely separately in another way. This result. Um, which let's not worry about the, the details of it, but the point is this is the, the formal analog of Goose theorem in the discrete setting. So um, we managed to prove that um, there is uh, 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 yeah the, the formal analog of Goose theorem in the discrete setting holds. But of course we don't have any of his tools. We didn't have anything to do with the Borsegulam theorem or or the you know, it, it's we we, we we had to prove things by very, very different methods. Um, so the proof by Michael Tang um, was done by, by a very careful understanding of the arguments of Tidor, Yu, and Zhao. And the proof that Michael and I did together was to, we basically applied, we took the results of um, Zhang and we applied the duality theorem to it. So that was kind of a cheat, if you like. But, um, but at, least, at least formally, the argument for, for the, 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 the goof gave um, not the argument, the, the, the good result is is kind of true, but we don't understand in, in, really understand the geometry that's going on behind it. So it, you know, what's the what are the measurements of like directional surface area and, and visibility, which I didn't mention? And do they have some analog in this setting? Um, so that that's that's still kind of a little bit um, unclear. So there's some um, questions. Yeah. So so can can we realize? This last this last theorem in terms of geometric concepts, which are similar to the ones Goof used, um, is there a direct proof looking at how, looking at the other way around a direct proof of not the decay theorem on the maximal function side? We don't know the answer to these. Um, yeah, the auxiliary structural hypothesis is an issue. Um, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, so, so final slide. Um, this is a this is a question to to, to tempt you, and um, there's a very beautiful inequality. Which is due to um uh yeah probably I'm I'm I, I 
I should, have, I, should have, I should have phrased this slide separately. There's a very beautiful inequality of Bill Baker, um, which is the, the sharp young convolution inequality. And the sharp young convolution inequality is can be presented in a more um uh, a more uh, sort of a broader setting in the context of what are called brass cap leave inequalities. And in particular, there are there are there are classes of of what are called geometric brass cap leave inequalities. And so there's a, a geometric brass cap leave inequality, which is equivalent to one of the special cases of um of sharp young inequality, which says the following that if you've got um three unit vectors, omega one, omega two, omega three in R2, and they have angles um 200 to 120 degrees. Whoops, yeah, that's right, yeah. So 120 is that two pi over three. Three to load my three unit vectors. Then, um, if I project, take a function on the real line fj. If I um, apply that, if I compose that with projection on the, perpen the plane perpendicular to omega j. So, so it's like a Lewis Whitney inequality, except that I've got sort of three um, three factors here in a two dimensional situation, and the power is different. The, the moral is like a Lewis Whitney inequality. Um, that that that's that's the um that's what we get. So um the sharp constant in this inequality is one and it's obtained by testing on Gaussians. So the, the duality theorem that we stated tells us the following. Um for every function g in L2 of R2 with more than one, then there exist three functions on R2, little g1, little g2, little g3, such that capital G is dominated by the geometric mean of these little g's, and such that for every bridge of the three j's, for almost every line parallel to omega j, we integrate gj over L, we get something which is less than or equal to one. So this is a this is a true fact, and the challenge is to um, prove it. Can can you actually can you um find a recipe? Can you can you can you understand how to build um, gj satisfying this in terms of the inputs? But the point is, at the moment, it, it, it's a, it's an it's a application of the abstract duality theorem. So it uses all this minimax stuff and key fan minimax lemmas, and um, you know, we just don't have a handle on how to construct these functions, but we do know they exist. And um, you know, and given that I know um, people here in the audience are they, they like questions about sharp constants and extremizers and and you know, things that Bill Beckner has been interested in. So I, I, I leave that with you as a challenge. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tony, for the nice talk. Uh, are there any questions or comments from the audience or of the Zoom? If you guys are on Zoom, see you, Andrea, if you want to ask anything. Hi, Kevin. Uh, I don't know if you can unmute yourself or not. Well, a very stupid question. Why is the arbitrary field? Uh, we mean a finite field? No, no, no arbitrary field. So you consider also R with yes. the yes. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so some problems make sense. So the Kakea problem makes sense only in finite fields, but the multilinear Kakea problem <laughs> makes sense in, in arbitrary fields. So, Tony, if I understood correctly on your last slide, yeah. you're affirming, right, that, that that is a sharp inequality realized by Gaussians, the, the one in blue. That's a, yeah, this, that's this is a sharp inequality. inequality. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, yeah. that's a fact. Yeah, right? And you just you check it with, with the standard Gaussians, and it's just true. Yeah. And the red one is also a fact that comes from your theory, and you want yeah. to you, you yeah, have like a, a, a like constructive one. recipe. To yeah, uh, at least to some, you know, to some extent. Yeah. And this would be the first kind of non-trivial case to think about. I mean, three, you, you chose with three angles, but uh, yeah. there will be no interesting thing with two. No, because it's in two, it's, 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 it's the Bloom's Whitney, and, and I can write down factorization statements. I can write down this sort of statement explicitly and easily of Paul Bloom's Whitney. And then I also assume that we would have a similar statement in question with four or five. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This is just, this is just the basic yeah, case. This is, uh, this is just the first case, yeah. Yeah. yeah but of course, because we know these things, we, we know that Gaussians are really important in this. So, I mean, obviously, we're Gaussians are going to be really important in this too. But, but I, I, I don't see any way to. I, I don't see how. 
construct a little Jesus into the big Jesus and go back to Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it all has to be impossible. Well, I'll, I'll be actually, I'll be honest with you, I mean, even in the case of Loomis Whitney, where, where, where doing the analog of this is trivial, it still took me six months to realize why it was trivial. So, um, <laughs> so, so. I mean, it's a big fact, right? Yes. Are there questions or comments from the audience here or on Zoom? And the audience are the only externalizers on this? Um, uh, I think so. I forgot, but I think so. Yeah. I, 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 I yeah, I think so. I should know that. Go <laughs> <laughs> on Zoom. Okay. Kevin, uh, thank you for the great talk. Okay, so there are no questions here. Let's thank Tony again for a very nice talk.